Nearly 80% of the cannabis sold in the UK is now homegrown. 53 in here and three mother plants. Cannabis production is one of Britain's fastest growing industries. What do you want? Come on, uh, you can do. You got to it to do it. Last year, the police seized two hundred million pounds worth of cannabis plants. Police! Police! I'm going inside the world of cannabis growers and dealers. Once for the morning, once for the midday, and once for the evening. I'm going to follow the money all the way up the chain. At the moment, people are paying me seven thousand two hundred pounds. On a kilo. On a kilo, right. That's 200 pound an ounce, 36 ounces. I'll get 3,000, 4,000. I have a reach house every three months. My investigation will reveal how what began as a dope smoker's hobby has become an industry worth billions of pounds. I don't think anyone should be under the impression that just because it's small and in its house that it's not going to be profitable. It is very profitable. You take claw hammers, you take machetes, Tie ropes, ratchet ties, duct tape. And I'll discover just how far organised criminals will go to take control of a business awash with easy money. I've got to sleep with a baseball bat, just in case. People would start thinking that I've got such and such, and I might become a target. Just give them a good beating on the legs, you know what I mean, across the ribs, and hammers on the feet and the toes and stuff. They soon start talking. Different breeds. Yeah, all different breeds, different strengths, so uh, different type. Lemon skunk. This one is kosher kush. Kosher kush. Uh, over there, I've got grapefruit, and then Dutch delight. This is like pretty much a straight indica. Over here is the sativas, top of heaven at the back. These are all names of different strains of cannabis. Britain has become a nation of cannabis connoisseurs. Ben has given me access to his loft, where, like thousands of cannabis users. He's growing his own supply. There's lots of variety. The sativas, they've got more uppy high and the indicas are more of a heavy stone, so... Right. I like a majority of different mix and matches. One's for the morning, one's for the midday and one's for the evening, so... It's all about the flavours now. Everyone thinks it's all about the strength, but to be honest, it's all about the flavours. So, by doing it this way, how much money do you think you save? Um, a substantial amount of money. What would it be worth? Well, ounce today, if it's good smoke anyway, you, you're looking at upwards of 200, so 2, 220. So three or four grand. Yeah, yeah, or upwards, yeah. On the streets, cannabis costs around 10 pounds a gram, so a unit is called a 10 bag. But dealers like the old measures. They do business in ounces, which is 28 grams. They can usually buy an ounce for 200 quid, so when they're selling it for 280, they're making a 40% markup. Not bad for a business with no overheads. Well, to be honest, it's so easy to make money off this, but at the end of the day, it's, it's one of those two, two options. You're either in it to make money or you're in it for your smoke. A lot of work. Well, it's either that or spend all my hard-earned cash giving it to some 16-year-old kid on a push bike who's just selling, like, 10s and 20s, getting ounces off actual drug dealers who have Class A's, I try and keep myself far, far away from that. And how many people in, do you know about are growing as well in this area? I would say in the close area of about 10 miles, about 20 people. I would say in the closest city, upwards 40. And they're just people you know. And that's just people I know. And these are people that don't sell, sell at all. It's, it's all personal. Cannabis is the UK's most widely used illegal drug. Nearly three million people consume over a thousand tons of it every year. Thirty years ago, most of our cannabis was imported from Africa and the Caribbean. It was mainly hash produced from cannabis resin. 
Ian Oxley has been testing cannabis for 40 years. He's noticed a change in the source of the drug. Today, 80% of all cannabis consumed is grown right here in the UK. 30 years ago, it would have been one or two plants grown in a plant pot on a windowsill or in a greenhouse. Um, then in the late 80s, early 90s, we started to see the introduction of internal cultivation, controlling the light, the heat, the feeding, the watering. This has meant that cannabis smokers are consuming a quite different product. So instead of having leaf material and the odd flowering plant, what they're generating now is female flowering plants with no seeds, which is the basic definition of skunk. Skunk is just one of hundreds of strains of cannabis, but it's often used as a catch-all term for all potent forms of the drug. Cannabis is composed of many active ingredients, tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and cannabidiol, CBD, are the main two. CBD tends to be the one when people are talking about the mellowing effects or the medicinal effects. THC tends to be the one which is harsher and sharper, but the one which gives you the hallucination or the, the high, if you like. Police test the THC levels of seized cannabis to determine its potency. The higher the potency, the higher the commercial value. You will be executing misuse of drugs act warrants in relation to cannabis cultivations. The number of cannabis farms being uncovered by police is on the up. As you're all aware now, cannabis cultivations are linked to organised serious crime. To get an idea of the kind of places being used as cannabis farms, I'm out with Merseyside Police on their early morning drug raids. We're going to pull up outside the address. These officers here are going to force entry into the premises if necessary. Once they're in and secured, and we'll conduct a full search of the premises. The police say they're now busting an average of 28 cannabis farms a day around the country. Police! Stay with us! Police! They're being run by all sorts of different people. Is there a typical grower? Would you say from your experience? No, I'm sure not. Anyone? Anyone. Yeah. You're the 67-year-old the other week? 67-year-old. Increasingly, though, the police are finding farms inside residential properties. We obtained a warrant under the Misuse of Drugs Act, Section 23, which gives us an entitlement to search the premises for cannabis. Ooh, what else we got here? Right, well, evidence of cannabis cultivation fairly recently, from what I've you can see, I mean, the filter is still in place with the extraction, ducting, and then all around plants that have very recently been harvested. And in a box over here, we have several neatly packaged bags of dried cannabis, presumably for sale. They all look to be identical weights to me. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine or ten bags of dried cannabis there. Each one's about 200 pounds, so Right there's a couple of grand's worth of dried cannabis ready for sale. A 29-year-old man was arrested here for growing cannabis for sale. But some growers are keen to stay well away from police and criminals. The person that I used to get my supply from stopped supply. John, in his 40s, is a professional gardener. I didn't want to go and look on the black market for anyone else because I trusted this person. And so I decided I'd start growing my own. He's a respectable family man who believes that what he's been doing for the last six years is merely an innocent hobby. I've got a lot of horticultural knowledge, a professional grower. I've got an HND in horticulture. It's part of my profession, that's what I do. I give gardening advice, I garden. To me, it's just another plant but with some wonderful benefits. I don't know, it's a hobby and a passion. I don't really want to make illegal money out of it. If somebody came to me and said, it's legal now, we're looking for someone to grow, then I would be happy to be paid for growing cannabis. But it's just a step too far, a law too far for me. John doesn't sell any of his cannabis. For many personal growers, 
fear of those operating in the black market is a strong motivator for growing their own supply. The problem really with prohibition is that, you know, with prohibition the market is controlled majority by the black market you know, and, and criminal gangs. Quite often you're dealing with some very unsavoury characters, I mean, you know, who, who aren't just into growing cannabis, I mean, they could be involved in all sorts of other illegal activities, who are motivated by profit and, and money, and so they will tend to grow, you know, a substandard product. Orson is the founder of the London Cannabis Club. Since it was set up two years ago, it's attracted over four and a half thousand members. You know, people often mistake cannabis as being a subculture, um, but it's not a subculture at all, it's very much a mainstream issue. The long-term aim of the club is to encourage and support cannabis cultivation so members can become self-sufficient and avoid buying off the street. We have meetings all over London where we turn up to different locations. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's not about people just sitting around and getting completely stoned. You know, that's, that's not what happens. It's about people talking about ideas, discussing research, yes, using cannabis, uh, eating good food, you know, talking about politics. Imagine wine tasting. You see people sticking their nose into pots and rubbing their fingers and smelling them and, and tasting them and getting the different effects. There's been a massive explosion over, I suspect, the last five years. There's always been cannabis growers in the UK for many, many years. But now I think more and more people are choosing to grow their own. Britain is famously a green-fingered nation. But for many, growing cannabis is no longer just a pot on the windowsill. The development of indoor hydroponics and the availability of information on the internet have transformed the UK's cannabis production. Hydroponics itself, the technology has arguably been primarily developed for food production. You can point particularly to the Dutch system where they don't have a huge amount of land, but they have quite a large population. So there's lots of indoor agriculture, and lots of growing of, of fruit and vegetables and edible plants in greenhouses. And a technology that works for tomatoes, of course, also works for cannabis plants. Well, this is a hydroponic shop that I found online. It's one of about 50 within an hour of my house, and it purports to sell everything you could possibly need for growing plants indoors. So if I wanted to grow plants in, say, my spare room or my loft, would you have everything that I needed here to do that? Yeah, we've got everything here. We've got uh, lights, the tents, the system, everything for your electrics, your soils, your medium, nutrients, additives, anything really for growing indoors. So you Sounds can grow everything from, like, tomatoes, chilies, anything. Cannabis? Can't really talk about that due to the law um, and the Misuse of Drugs Act after that came in. We can't actually discuss anything regarding cannabis, I'm afraid. Right, OK. So if I was setting up myself tomorrow, let's say, and I know nothing about it, what, um, would, you, what would you recommend that I begin with? It can go from as basic as basic as soil in a pot to as complicated as aeroponics. And the more technical, um, you could get bigger crops or bigger yields. So I'd have bigger tomatoes. Oh, bigger tomatoes, yeah, for sure. Tastier tomatoes. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, obviously... Can't say anything about cannabis. Come over here, I'll show you one of the largest tents we do. So this is the green room? Yeah, uh, this is a 2.4 grow tent. Um, pretty big, got the air-cooled lighting in there. 600 watt parabolic. Uh, got all your ventilation and then just a little propagation unit in here. So is the idea with this that you put this tent inside your bedroom? Um, not necessarily a bedroom, let's say your grow space, so it could be a garage, shed, or wherever, or bedroom if you wish. Um, and it would fit in there, literally pop together, kind of like a gazebo, and then jobs are good and you're away. Why do you need a tent? Uh, it just contains the light, um, any odours or smells, and it's just easier to control an atmosphere if it's controlled. So. OK, odour and smell's a problem, is it? Um, yeah, yeah, with some things, it's just like, um, especially tomatoes can give off a little bit of a... Horrible scent. I'm guessing then, with all those things plugged in, this setup is going to cost quite a lot of money in terms of electricity just to run it. Yeah, yeah. Depending on your energy supply, anywhere between 90 and 120 pounds per month. Yeah. And how many plants would you recommend putting in that? 40, 
at least. Is that a lot of tomato? I mean, was that what you um, would say? Yeah, you would get quite a lot of yield of tomatoes off that, I but, would say. Yeah, so if you were to keep you going for a couple of months. A lot of salads. A lot of salads. <laughs> How many of these have you sold in, say, the last couple of weeks? Um, I would say just under 10 we sold these. We sell more of the smaller tents than we do the larger tents. The larger tents don't, don't really go as quick as the smaller tents. This is a metre square tent. As a starter, Beginner. this tent would be perfect. There's enough in here to do at least nine plants, I would say. How much does that whole setup cost me to put in my house? You're looking at anywhere between upwards of £400 to about £1,000. A large tent will set you back four grand. Even if that produced the very finest tomatoes flat out for a year, a keen salad grower would struggle to break even. But stick some cannabis plants in there and you could expect to harvest around a hundred grand. When you look at those kind of numbers purely as a business, I think a lot of companies out there would be quite happy to be making that kind of return on their investment. Cannabis farming has become so popular that specialist weed consultants now offer their services to help growers hone their skills and improve their yields. I help people set up their own grows so they can grow their own cannabis rather than go and buy it off the street. Stuart no longer grows himself, but as an expert gardener, he helps others to start growing cannabis. I would say that I've set up 20 to 30 grows easily. You'll usually get a gift at the end of it. Somebody will bring around an eight for a, an ounce or whatever, and they'll go, thank you very much. The potential for saving is astronomical, and the potential to actually make money from it is astronomical. A plant could be worth maybe £1,000, £1,500. Now, it won't buy you a Bentley, <laughs> but... Um, it certainly makes life, especially at the moment, makes life a little bit easier to deal with. The biggest growth that I know of at the moment would be 18, 20 plants. That is a for-profit growth. That's a disabled person who is trying to supplement their meagre income. And they're really having a hard time of it at the moment with all the cuts and the disability benefits being cut. So they're growing to have some sort of quality of life. I've helped set up, I think, five or six grows in total where they've seen the potential for profit and they've gone, right, and then they've bought more tents and they've converted whole rooms and it gets to that stage and then I walk away from that. Stuart may choose to walk away from the big money, but there are plenty of others ready to step in. With the huge margins and relatively low risks, it's hardly surprising that there are plenty of people ready to risk jail to get the drugs onto the street. What's more surprising is that one of them is prepared to show me how. So where are we going now? We are going to a uh, council estate area. This man has already served a six and a half year sentence for cannabis cultivation. But it hasn't stopped him selling drugs. I've got different clientels. I've got clients who do a nine to five job. You know, they need a small cannabis, whatever, tickles their fancy. We're there to provide for them because the niche market is there for them. Do you ever distribute in any of the sort of posher areas of town? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, the posher areas, the more into the A-class, I'm supplying in the Coke, the MDMA, XC. Do they ever take a bit of cannabis as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This is a customer now, isn't it? Yeah, it's a customer. OK. This is one of the dealer's most trusted customers. He's unaware he's being filmed. He's allowed to buy on credit and pay at the end of the week. No USB charging this car, mate. So what was you saying? What did you want? 10 or 120? Till Friday, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Sam. Is that cool, yeah? Yeah, no problem. What did you want to do? Yeah. Can you go for 20 if you can do it? Oh, yeah. then just make a note yeah. of what you... Yeah, definitely. Oh, then you're mate. It's on 70 now. 70, yeah? Yeah. Possibly 30 fries. And, uh, following Friday. Same. Same for him. Oh, right, no, same. Same. same a bit. How many customers did you say you've got? 100, 150 people. 
they're all buying sort of ten. Tens, twenties, and then we got about fifteen clients who will come purchase large amounts, half a kilos, kilos to two, three boxes. At the moment, people are paying me seven thousand two hundred pound on a kilo. On a kilo. Right. That's two hundred pound an ounce, thirty six ounces. Seven days a week. Seven days a week, 24-7. Whatever you need, you call us, you will supply. Show the lads what we're going to drop off now. So the person we're going to drop off now is another agent from around the area who buys in large quantities of us and sells in small quantities and makes his couple hundred pound on top. OK, so he's a little dealer himself. He's a little dealer himself. This is a half an ounce, just some low grade. It's cheese, but like, you know when you go through boxes and boxes of bud? Right. We have loads of dust left over. Of crumbs of bud and that. Right. So what we do is uh, we just give like 14, 15 grams, 16 grams of this for like 80 quid to the chap and he'll just buy a half an ounce of other bud, mix it up together. Okay. Distribute and he's made his extra couple of 100 pound on top. So he's using that as a kind of buffer to yeah. make a bit of extra yeah. cash. But we'll put like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 bud, 0.5 dust. Right. That's a 10 jewel there as well. Okay. And if, if someone sold you a 10 draw that was like that? I would not never be buying no 10 draws, mate. No, no, no. Yeah, I reckon I was there, man. Save me. Oh, yeah. You got that cheap? Yeah, there's 300 there, yeah, and it's 30 pounds from last night. Save me. Alright. Yeah, bro. Oh, hold on, yeah. Yeah. Save. Pound down. Check it's free there. It says 330 there with the 30 from last night. Alright. Oh, it's with 30, yeah. All there, yeah. How many grows have you got on the go at the moment? Yeah, at the moment, we have four houses on a three-month cycle each. And how many plants in each of those four grows? Each grow house has got roughly 200 to 250 plants. So um, there's about 1,000 plants. The roughly income of that is like every three months, 20 grand to 25 grand, depending on what you're growing. Nothing major. Right. It's a very frank explanation, and the sums are pretty staggering. Added up, it means a dealer can make up to £100,000 a year from cannabis alone. With all this cannabis washing around the system, I found myself wondering where it's coming from. Is the cannabis being grown commercially by dealers different from homegrown cannabis? Or is it all the same stuff? If we look at these two samples here, for example, that one, number two, um, was homegrown, and uh, this sample here, number three, we know was uh, was bought off the street, and they're all, almost identical. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference no. between those two. No. We've sourced different samples of cannabis off the street and from hobby growers all over the country. Do you see any great difference between the stuff that we know was bought on the street and the stuff that was homegrown? Certainly there's a great overlap between what we've seen bought from the street and what people are producing at home. Now that could be, of course, that what we've seen on the street is somebody else's homegrown. Right, so it's homegrown so, surplus. So it's homegrown surplus, which is then put into the street. So in actual fact, whether we're dealing with street imported or street homegrown, we don't know. So anyone buying cannabis off the street would find it hard to know whether it had been commercially produced or grown by someone in their loft and then sold onto the dealers. They have this idea of a slippery slope. Once you realise you can make some money, there may be a temptation for some growers to get more involved in the commercial side and to end up feeding into the established market, despite the initial intentions of being separate from the real dealers. There's a funny irony in this, that a lot of cannabis growers who said the reason they got into growing in the first place was that they didn't want to have to deal with criminals, have ended up growing more than they need for their own personal use. And then when they come to sell it, they have to sell it not just to the dealers they were avoiding, but the bosses of the dealers. So in the end, they're now doing business with more hardened criminals than they wanted to avoid in the first place. And it's the hardened criminals who are the real threat to the users, the growers, and the public in general who find themselves caught up in their violence. And some of them are very violent indeed.
with the domestic cannabis industry soaring, the police are having to dedicate ever more resources to tracking down the growers. In Liverpool, the police have a specific team that raids farms and destroys plants. Since it was set up nine months ago, the unit has busted nearly 300 farms across the city. This is a grow room one, contains 18 plants within a tent. Increasingly, the farms are hidden inside innocent looking private houses. Right, this is the next grow room, it contains 18 plants, and you can see the window has been this house has been entirely turned over to cannabis cultivation. 71 plants are spread across four rooms. Criminals often use more than one house to grow cannabis in, so the police dismantle the growing equipment and look for evidence that might lead them to other farms. 71 plants, how much, how much is that worth, would you say, ballpark? Well, it varies, but you're probably looking between 700 and 1,000 pound a plant. This is about 50 to 70 grand's worth of marijuana yeah. in there? Yeah, at least, yeah. Mm. Is this fairly typical of the kind of things that you're dismantling at the moment? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's really common, you're getting at least two a day, uh, sometimes even more. And it is, you know, you saw the state of the house, you know, it's, it is what the criminals do in these days. Merseyside police are busting farms like this twice a day. They may not be industrial-sized units, but since setting up in January, the cannabis dismantling team have seized £22 million worth of cannabis plants. Across the country, they report they've destroyed £200 million worth of cannabis, but if Liverpool is anything to go by, that figure could be even higher. This type of setup here is typical of the cannabis cultivations that we're seeing now, and these organised crime groups are going away from large commercial sites with say three or four hundred plants to something like this. They'll have ten dwelling houses in a community with 30 plants in each, which will give them the same yield and the same profitability. It's hard to believe that this has a direct link to an organised crime group. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it does. What will happen is these groups will uh, actually steal each other's crops uh, at times. That will then result in factional disputes over, over cannabis cultivation. That will then lead to firearms discharges, serious assaults and violence. But that all happens within our communities. So if the professional criminal gangs are downsizing, they may now be using exactly the same methods as the home growers. Small, easy to hide growing areas inside houses. It's helping them avoid police detection and thereby spreading the risk. So for the top tier criminals, it means fewer losses and higher profits. It's good business practice. A growing business needs to grow its supply chain, which is exactly what this man has done. How many different grows have you got going on at any one time? Mm, three, three, four. It depends how much space you can get hold of as well. And so the only limit to how much money you can make is how many properties you can access. And are they all in properties that you personally own or rent? No. You grow no. in other people's properties? Yeah. Don't do that at your own spot. If you do that at your own spot, you're more likely to get caught. So how do you find a spot? People in situations. Everybody's in a situation or another. If you give them a solution, sometimes they take it. As long as you can persuade them that the risks are minimal, why not? So what kind of people have you persuaded? People that are hard up for cash and have a property, or has a property that no one's attending so frequently, you can get away with it, it only takes a couple of months. Well, I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> I've got a property no one ever comes to, I'm away a lot. Well... Could you set up a grow room in, in my house? If you wanted to, wouldn't it be a problem get some extra income in. Your annual income will go up. Extra holiday here or there. How many people have you made this arrangement with in the past? A few. I wouldn't really like to get into detail because then people that may know me would start thinking that I've got such and such and I might become a target, which is not in my plans. 
And have any of them ever been caught? Yeah, people always get caught. But then what happens? If we have this arrangement going and then the police come to my door and I get arrested with all these plants... <laughs> well, that's one of the risks. And as, as it stands, like, I've taken enough risks already in my lifetime. That's why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it now. So it's me that goes to jail? Probably, but, yeah. But you're not? I'll probably be on a beach somewhere. I'm struck by how frankly he admits to manipulating people into risking jail to grow for him. There are clear examples, I think, of where the criminal, the organised crime side of the cannabis cultivation industry has exploited the more innocent cottage industry type growers by recruiting them to run a particular grow operation. For some people who've been coerced into cannabis cultivation, the only way out is the police. There are some people who are growing cannabis who are doing it because they're being pressurised. And initially, whilst they may have thought they could either get away with it or they could put up with the pressure, it's got to a point where actually the level of criminality they're now being asked to become involved in has become too much. And at that point, they've made that decision that they're no longer willing to do it. It's not hard to imagine how easy it might be for someone using drugs to run up considerable debts. And the people they owe money to are probably not the sort you would want to argue with. And how did you first get into growing cannabis then? It was a debt. Yeah. Growing at a council. When you say you're in debt, we're not talking about the bank. No. An individual. An associate, yeah. Um, just under two and a half thousand pounds. And when he first said to you, okay, you owe me two and a half grand but you can pay that off by growing cannabis for me. What did you think of that? Um, I refuse. Obviously, intimidation, threats. Threatened to go to relatives, parents, brothers, sisters. So I just had to say, yeah, I had no choice. I had no choice. The guy that you were growing for, did you know that he was using other people to grow as well? Yes, I did, yeah. Was he known for that? Um, yeah, he's a bit of a bully. And then I guess it's quite a responsibility as well, because you've got to be there every day, yep. put an eye on it every day. It's, yep. it's not the sort of thing you can you can walk away from. And it's not just the responsibility factor, it's the scare factor as well. I mean, obviously, if it's other drug dealers or people who want to make a quick book, find out about it, I mean, they'll kick off your door and take whatever's in there. And if you're in there, at the same time, give you hiding. How does that affect your mental state? Do you become paranoid? I'd go to sleep with a baseball bat, just in case. Mm. Every morning I'd get up and think, my door hasn't come off today. More and more criminals are attracted to cannabis farming by the potential to make serious money. And unsurprisingly, with that comes violence. But flashing money around also attracts attention. So how do the guys at the top of the chain manage to disguise where their wealth is coming from. As I follow the money up the ladder, I'm discovering that smart money is also clean money. This man is using cannabis to build himself a property empire. Years ago, he was growing cannabis himself, but now he owns a private property company, buying and letting out houses. He uses some of these properties to set up cannabis farms, but it's still a legal business should the police come knocking. All I do is private houses. We bought terraced houses for like 20, 30 grand per ton. They paid off after the first three grows. They paid for. What's the perfect property for you to set up growing? Every premises that you can do it in, we've done it. Business units, Flats everywhere, any kind of property you can do with it, we can do. We've, we've done it over the years. So the first, so when you get a new property, the first thing you're looking to do is grow cannabis in it. As a letters agent, if we look for where to grow rather than to get tenants in, or where tenants will be like to live or whatever. And how many grows have you got on the go now? Now there's about seven houses, and I've got people 
you look after. And how does the money work then? What kind of return do you get on your investment? I'll get 3,000 to 4,000 out of each house every three months. So 12 grand a year? That's just on one house. And you've got seven houses? Yeah. So you're making 84 grand a year Perfect. cash. And are you not worried then that properties that have got your name on could get busted by the police? It's, it's happened. I'm a partner in the letting agency. So we've got papers with identifications. You're not saying you're renting a property. Once they're rented over, we, oh, my job is just to collect the rent. My record's clean and I want to keep it that way. And this is the best way for me to keep out of it. It's proving to be a successful strategy. A criminal enterprise, but seemingly legal and above board, producing lots of clean money, often untraceable and unseen by the taxman. My interviewee seems very confident that his business will continue to grow. But like any business, there are always people looking to muscle in. And in the criminal world, that muscle can get physical. To avoid being busted by the police or rival gangs, Kay, who told me earlier how he sets up cannabis farms in other people's houses, is trying a novel approach. He started growing outside. Why even bother growing outside? You don't have to pay for electricity. You don't have to worry so much about the police are kicking off a door because it's outside and if they find it, no one's really going to get into trouble. And there's no better form of light than sunlight. Fuck, you know. That's where the first one was. Someone's going to feed the crop. The soul, it was here. And someone's obviously came over the night time and taking the stuff. Second one. You can see the patches where they've been lifted up. Fourth one, gone. Fifth one, gone. Little bastards had my thing away. Oh, well, let me check the last ones. Yeah, all gone as well. You can see that there was down there. And down there. Yep, all gone. All gone. I've got a little inkling who it may be. With each cannabis plant worth up to a thousand pounds, the threat of extreme violence between rival producers is never far away. I'm about to find out just how lucky Kay may have been. At least his cannabis wasn't stolen by force. Just keep a good eye out for um, any firearms. Um, and any... Criminal cannabis cultivators have been changing their tactics to avoid detection. The log says that there is approximately 50 to 60 plants in the basement. Instead of big industrial sized farms, many criminals are now hiding their enterprises in our communities and using residential homes to grow in. Should be under the impression that just because it's smaller than its house that it's not going to be profitable it is very profitable what people are doing in the houses and it's enough to uh, fund criminal groups last year the police say they destroyed 200 million pounds worth of cannabis plants Organised crime groups are making money out of this and they're blighting society with their activities. So, for me, the possession of cannabis, you can keep that to one side and look at the production of cannabis. That is funding organised crime groups and I don't think any community would say that they're happy with that.
The whole drugs market in the UK is probably about £6 billion a year. Now, if there are two to three million cannabis users, it's difficult to estimate exactly, but we're talking massive profits. So it's not surprising that criminals get involved. And it's not surprising that because the market is illicit, they don't use solicitors to resolve their issues over territory. They use violence. It does seem to be a very palpable fear amongst growers of the kind of people who are going to kick their doors in, who are coming to look for their cannabis to steal it. You know, at the end of the day, you're growing cannabis in your spare room, you're breaking the law, and I think a lot of these gangs realise that they can kick your door in, they can steal your cannabis, and you've got nobody to turn to. It's not as though you're going to call the police. Getting inside the world of violent criminals is difficult. But I've found someone prepared to explain what really happens when there's a drugs bust. Not one carried out by the police, but by people like him. How would you describe your job, your profession, to me? Just got to do whatever is making money, basically, you know what I mean? But at the moment, there's a lot of people growing and everything, so it's easier work. It's like before we used to sort of, um, you know, go out and um, basically do like armed robberies and things like that, but you get high prison sentences. But now, are you actually, are you hitting people that are growing cannabis? Yeah, 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 because there's enough people out, bigger people out there doing this, the growing, you and me. The only punks anyway, then, even criminals, they think they can get rich by doing a bit of growing and stuff, you get me? So, they're just going on like pussies, so at the end of the day, I just take what's mine. It ain't nobody's. They're doing wrong and I'm doing wrong. Now people are just sort of like taking uh, small houses where they don't rouse suspicion, you get me, to try to blend in with the families. But that's where the fuck up is. So what, what are the telltale signs then that you're looking for? When you, you say you can spot people are growing, what, what, what do they do? Well, you basically, you look at curtains and stuff that have never been drawn. You heard me? Bin bags ain't been put out. So if somebody's supposed to be living out white, they don't bring rubbish, you get me? And what do you do then once you get inside? What's the most valuable thing? Are you just after the cannabis, or do you want the lights and everything else? The lights are worth though as well, do you get me? You know, sometimes it depends. For example, if you hit it at the wrong time and the plants are young and they're immature, then, yeah, we take the lights and we take the grows, we take the chemicals, everything else, sell them on to bear people, no problem whatsoever. But if it's a good, if it's a good crop, we just crop it leave the lights behind, too bulky sometimes. And what's an average volume of cannabis that you'd get from a Well, easy, blood. I mean, you're talking about one tent, right? You, you know, you're talking about 20 plants in there, easy. Yeah, decent size one. You're talking four, four key there. Right. Yeah. So a good hit for you, you'd expect to get around 20 grand. Yeah, but what it is, 20 grand's like the top market, but I've got a man basically who just buys blind, you get me? And he's, he's, he's proper and he's, like, discreet. Yeah, so he won't give me the 20, he'll give me less, but I know the money's guaranteed. Does it ever get violent? Ready for it. But did people fight back? Sometimes, yeah, but we just deal with them, you get me? And how do you deal with them? We just beat the shit out of them, torture them if we have to, you know what I'm saying? Really, the torture is like sort of pre, really, because you want to know where things are, and we're hiding money, and, you know, where the grows are and stuff. What kind of weapons do you take to a job with you? Anything, you take claw hammers, you take machetes, you know what I mean? Tie up ropes, ratchet ties, duct tape, you know what I'm saying? If you're taking ratchets and duct tape and stuff like that, is that, is that for tying people up? What's that? Yeah. Basically, yeah, sometimes they know where other people are doing things as well, so not just the, the, the plants we're going to take from one yard, plus there might be two or three more places that they know about, because they look after different, different places, you get me? So I just have to give them a good hiding and get extra information. Right. Yeah. And what's your, uh, what's your best torture technique for getting information out of people? All sorts of things like blocks of wood and stuff, you get me? You don't, you don't really want to like go OTT over them because at the end of the day, you just want the information out of them, you get me? Yeah. 
but you know, just give him a good beating on the legs, you know what I mean, across the ribs and stuff, like two by twos, you know what I'm saying, uh, hammers on the, like, like the, you know, feet and, and the toes and stuff, and whack him a few times with hammers on there, they soon start talking. I know it sounds bad and everything else, but we ain't there to make friends. Uh, do you enjoy your job? Not really. I wouldn't say really I enjoy my job. It's something that I've got to do. Something there that's got to be done. You get me? I'm just going to reap it in while I can while something changes at the end of the day. I might just fucking legalise it tomorrow and man and man can grow it legalised, so that's going to be the end, end of that. The legalisation of that would put you out of work? Put me out of work. Prohibition style. Through the whole of this investigation, I've been warned that there's a much darker criminal side to the cannabis industry, and I think I just came face to face with it. It's maybe not surprising when you consider the sums of money involved that a guy like him would move out of armed robbery into stealing cannabis. And actually, he's the ultimate deterrent, because when you think, who would you rather kicking your door down, him or the police? Well, I know which one I'd choose. It's hardly surprising then that for the people I've met throughout this investigation, the levels of fear are high. It's the scare factor as well. I mean, I'd go to sleep with a baseball bat, just in case. But so every morning I'd get up and think, my door hasn't come off today. I don't want to be always looking over my shoulder, waking up so early in the morning thinking that my door's going to come off. It's said that if you arrest a drug dealer, you are simply creating a job opportunity for the next drug dealer to step into their shoes. And frankly, from my experience and from the experience of many police, that's exactly the case. If I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. And there's plenty of people out there doing it. So why don't I just have a bit of slice of it? It's estimated that over 400,000 people are growing cannabis in the UK with a market worth billions of pounds. What's happened is that under prohibition, this uh, market, and it's a very big market, has been handed to criminals. So criminals are making a huge uh, profit, and they're balancing that huge profit against the relatively low chance of getting caught. So it's very much worth their while to get into the drugs uh, trade, make huge profits, and largely avoid detection. I mean, they should legalise it anyway in this country to put a stop to it all. Maybe that's the kind of thing I need to put me out of business. Because I'm not going to stop otherwise. You know, if it's just coming in, money coming in, work, but I'm not going to stop. But if they did do something like that, then obviously I'd stop. This year, the government saw no reason to fundamentally change policy. Cannabis is a controlled drug. It's a Class B drug under the Misuse of Drugs Act. There doesn't seem to be much appetite at the moment amongst the major political parties to even engage in debates about possible changes. I think that it's maybe seen more as a vote-losing issue than a vote-winning issue because many people out there still see cannabis potentially as a dangerous drug or see it as a moral issue. However, the status quo is clearly problematic. Having a market that is illegal opens the door to criminals getting involved. I'm just gonna reap it in while I can. The market's good at the moment, trust me, yeah. It's doing good, the more the merrier.